Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to begin our morning study with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful uh, for the time that we have each morning uh, to study together and um, for the things that you show us and the conviction that it brings upon our hearts and the power that it provides in our day-to-day -day lives. And we just pray, Lord, again, for your presence here as we try to grapple with these truths and understand how they apply it at the present time. We know we are in the midst of prophecies being fulfilled. And that we are privileged to be participants in the events that are unfolding around us. And we just pray, Lord, that we can recognize the seriousness of these situations. We pray for each person. You know our limitations as human beings, but we also know, Lord, your power. That what's, what, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And so we ask for your help. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again. Now, uh, Dwight's here. He's feeling better than yesterday. Probably not 100% yet, though. Uh, correct. Now, Theodore, <clears throat> I, if it's all right, I'd like to say a couple of things. Okay. All right. Now, I did not anticipate yesterday that I was going to have to go through vertigo again. Yeah. This is one of the things that, that I've had to deal with from time to time. And Theodore did allude to a document that I had sent out regarding the EFA, which we may or we may not address further today. Now, <clears throat> very specifically, I did go over the majority of yesterday's meeting. To be very clear, <clears throat> I am not here to take over anything. I will at times agree to lead out. I will at times present. These are collaborative studies. These are studies that require and need everybody's input because the times in which we are living require perspectives so that we may more fully understand that which we are currently going through and studying. Now, yesterday was kind of a, a difficult day. I don't know if any of the rest of you have been aware, but I was, I was very unaware of some things that were going on. I spoke with Brother Toby yesterday and was informed that his dear wife, Sister Nyla, had passed to her rest. And that yesterday was the day that they laid her to rest. Oh. Here. Apparently, she had broken her leg. They had taken her in for care. While she was in the care at the hospital, apparently they, they brought in hospice to help to care for her. Her leg never improved, and she never improved. So I would ask that we keep... Brother Toby at this time in our prayers and his family as well, because <clears throat> this is never very easy. <clears throat> so that's, that's what I asked to say. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, it's um, difficult to hear. Yeah, we really appreciated uh, Nyla 
And uh, I know it'd be hard for Toby. So yeah, thanks for telling us about that. Um, now I don't think um, getting back to some of the other things you mentioned uh, that uh, he, that Ron meant it in that way that you're actually taking it. <laughs> no, I'm, the, the point is it went into the record. Yeah. I, I'm not taking it that Ron meant it. Yeah. Any other, I mean, the, the words could have been more carefully chosen. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so. not upset, but I'm making it a yeah. point because I mean, I, I look at so many things that have gone on within these meetings mm -hmm. and I know that I am very much the least of all of you. Well, I don't know. Yeah, all of us should probably consider the fact that, you know, we, without, we without God, um, right. we are nothing. And that he gives us all of the different people uh, as, we all have strengths as um, a part of understanding truth. Mm -hmm. So it, it's extremely important that we have different people participating. Right. I mean, that's why God put me in a church to begin with. Because if I just was by myself studying, I wouldn't, you know, I could be misled and go off in different directions. So having people around to correct you is, uh, uh, you know, it's a blessing, right? Right. And, you know, as I've said before, I mean, I, I feel this responsibility because of the light God's given us uh, to share things. Otherwise, I would just not share anything with anybody. Right. You know, there's no reason, you know, for me personally, that I have a need from a personal point of view to have to teach people things, but from a sense of responsibility. And so I've had to learn to go from being an extremely introverted person who doesn't like to interact with other people to have to go and do presentations. And so I always thought, you know, from the beginning, you know, other people would just take this stuff and go with it. But I realize, you know, we've, we have these responsibilities uh, to share truth and to study together. So that's what this group is, is about. Now, uh, referring to your paper, is there any particular thing that we, you think we missed in that study of the EFA? I mean, we obviously didn't look at all the verses, right? Okay. And we didn't look at the other words that are related, like the, you know, the other forms of measurement and how this word is translated, you know, like uh, looking at the bath, for instance, which is just the liquid measure of an ether. Right. And, the and, purpose, and, the and pur yeah. okay, the purpose of this study in the book of Judges has been to see what? Has it not been to see <clears throat> the the book of Judges as a message to the movement. Mm -hmm. Then when we came to this <clears throat> on the sacrifice, mm -hmm. why did we look at it strictly as a literal sacrifice? Well, we didn't look at it as a literal sacrifice. How did we apply the different elements? Um, we took them symbolically. Okay. So the ephah symbolically was seen as being what? As a measurement of judgment. So it's, it's to measure things, whether you're measuring lengths, like measuring the city, or measuring volume or weight, um, these are all symbols of judgment. And, and we look specifically at the ephah in uh, Zechariah and also um, in Ezekiel. So we could see that this, this agreed with that idea that this is about judgment. And it's about just judgment. That's what we get from Ezekiel. It's all about just measures and, and other places that we looked as well. And in an Ezekiel, it's applying to this measuring of the temple, right? So Ezekiel is this construction of the temple, Ezekiel 40 to 45, and you got 
chapter 45, where it's going to talk about the manna and how it's divided and, and uh, so forth. So, so to me, it just shows that this sacrifice is relating to uh, a message that is judging us and that is, um, uh, is based upon chronology. So all these dates and everything that we're doing is, is part of that, um, that message. So can the EFA also be a just measurement of time? Yeah. Yeah, that's the idea. Well, <clears throat> how do we support that? Well, because of, in Ezekiel, we have uh, all of these different measurements and we showed when we studied Ezekiel that these all referred to time, that we could, we could take the symbols. For instance, we have uh, the manna and we apply that to time and that's a weight. We had lengths that we used and we applied those to time. Uh, we even used the volume of the bath and, um, and the ephah to refer to time. So, so we've already done that in the past. So if we were to consider a symbol from the book of Ruth that has to do with this, that was in the paper. Would this also give us <clears throat> license to view this as being a symbol that's important for the movement today? Yeah. Now, and the one in Ruth is to 17 which is a symbol of midnight right and she gleaned the field until even and beat out that she had gleaned and it was about an ephah of barley so here what we were talking about was the gleaning um in the context of what this movement is doing in how we're studying we're basically gleaning the field right that's that's how i look at how these studies have gone in the morning meetings right Right. We're looking for these these precious grain, things that have been missed. And, and we have it, it, the field until even right till evening. Um, and what would evening symbolize? Literally, we'd have the the, uh, the close of the day and the beginning of the next day. Yeah, so yeah, technically the beginning of the next day, the day begins at even, right, from even until even. Um, but we have it as a symbol um, in Millerite history. Okay. Right. So we know right. that we have, because we have midnight, that means we also had evening and we also have morning. And when uh, it talks about it here in Judges, where it talked about uh, they had to do things in the night, not in the day. And it doesn't matter whether it's evening in the morning or evening in the, in the evening, if you know what I mean. It's, it's the transition point, just like noon can symbolize midnight. Right? Okay. So there's just a point of time in which we glean. That gleaning occurs until even. Right. And then when we have gleaned, we have this measurement that was about an ephah, a barley. So we have the ephah there represented. And so this is a measurement of judgment that's occurring in Ruth 21 7. So the symbol of midnight, right? 217. Right. So, so obviously it would apply. And then when we look at this as well, in 1 Samuel 17, 17. 17, 17, we have a doubling. Right. And Jesse said unto David, his son, take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn and these 10 loaves and run to the camp of thy brethren. Now, this is just before David's confrontation with Goliath. Right. And so again, you have um, a number of symbols here. Uh, you have um, 10 loaves 
and 10 is a symbol of the remnant. Right. It's also a symbol of test. And of course, they're loaves. So this is something that has been prepared, right? And it's been prepared from an ephah. No, the ephah is separate. Yeah, the ephah is separate, but it, it's prepared with this. Um, you have the 10 loaves and the ephah. So you're going to bring an ephah of parched corn. And, and this parched corn actually uh, refers back to what we were studying with uh, the manna. Um, when when it ends, because the reason that they they end the manna is they're going to each eat parched corn, right? Okay. Right. I, I mean, it's going to be in my paper. So so we, that's one of the verses we have to look at. We're understanding what parched is, and um, because some people have a misunderstanding about how what it is they're eating when they enter when they cross the Jordan River and then they they gather the manna on the, the Passover is the last time they gather it. And then they're going to eat uh, parched grain or parched corn on, on the Sabbath, right? And then on Sunday, they go out to gather the manna that there is none. Um, and so understanding what that is, um, is, is an important part of understanding that whole issue dealing with the manna and the wave sheaf offering, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, you got the 10 loaves, the symbol of the rev remnant, and you have an ephah, a parched corn. So this is a measurement um, that, uh, that refer refers to judgment. I take ephah as, as a judgment, a message of judgment. Now, <clears throat> Proverbs 2010, divers weights and divers measures, both of them alike are an abomination unto the Lord. Mm -hmm. But we follow that also with Ezekiel 4510. You shall have just balances and a just ephah and a just bath. Right. And so what we see, it, to me, diverse weights and diverse measures um, would refer to, of course, uh, people cheating in, in when they're doing transactions. And this would be the deceptive way in which people try to manipulate things uh, to get conclusions that they want. Right? Does that also apply with prophecy? Well, yes. That's, that's the point, that this is the study of the Bible, right? And, and judging other people correctly, too. So if you have two different standards of judgment, how you look at, at how you judge yourself and how you judge others in the sense that um, you don't judge others fairly, uh, that would be part of it as well. Now... <clears throat> All of the verses in Ezekiel have quite a bunch, quite a bit of import for us regarding this on the ephah. Mm -hmm. But when we come back into, as you were mentioning with Zechariah, especially chapter five. Yeah. You deal with the situation of the ephah and how in Zechariah 5, Zechariah 5, 7, it states, and behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead, and this is a woman that sitteth in the midst of an ephah. Yeah, so it's represented as a talent of lead. But the, the point that I was looking at mm -hmm. had more to do with a woman sitting in the midst of the ephah, much like the woman that sits upon the waters. Mm -hmm. Now, if we equate the bath as the liquid version of the dry ephah, mm -hmm. Is this then a woman that is sitting on 
governments rather than on people as a woman sitting on on waters would be. Uh, so you're saying that that it's governments? N n no. Um, at least my initial reaction is. Um, so when we look at Zechariah, uh, who's being judged here? What is this? I mean, we'd have to go into Zechariah and look a little bit more closely at that. Um, there are differences of opinion about Zechariah. Um, but to me, this is all a message to the house of Israel, right? Because they're it's the prophet Zechariah is talking about the rebuilding of the temple. Right. Uh, Haggai and Zechariah are both prophesying at the, in the time of the, rock, the Persian. Right. And, and they're going to have all of these messages, you know, Joshua, the high priest, uh, chapter three, the vision of the lampstand, chapter four. Then you're going to have the flying scroll and the vision of a woman in the basket in chapter five. Um, we understand that the, the symbol of the woman is symbol of a church. Can be either a true church or a false church. And in this, mm -hmm. in this case, I would almost think it is an apostatized church. Right. This isn't, I don't think it's Babylon being represented, though. That's what most commentators would look I'm, at. I'm not willing to say it's Babylon. Yeah. So I think this is talking about God's church. And, and the reason why is when you go uh, to Zechariah uh, chapter one, um, it's going to and it's going to talk about the 70 years that the temple is laying in ruins. Right. And it's going to give us some dates. And Zechariah one seven. 1 verse 7 says upon the four and twentieth day of the 11th month which is the month Sebat in the second year of Darius came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah the son of Berechiah the son of Ido the prophet right now it's going to talk here uh, in verse 12 about the 70 years right and most people just assume where it says um, the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah, against which thou hast had indignation these three score and ten years? And so most people just think that's the Babylonian captivity period. But this is the period that the temple is laying in ruins. And it isn't 70 years yet. At this time, it's um, about... Uh, 60 66 years something like that um so but it's still referred to by the angel as a period of 70 years because it's going to be a period of 70 years and um <clears throat> and so the idea here is is that this is a period of 70 years distinct from the period of the 70 years of the babylonian captivity which ended with cyrus coming to the throne um but a, a couple of little points here. If you go back uh, and if you go to chapter two, then, because this is all going to be part of that vision. And in chapter two, he's going to see a man with a measuring line in his hand. And I said, whither goest thou? And he said unto me to measure Jerusalem, to see what is the breadth thereof and is what the, is the length thereof. Now, we see this also in Ezekiel chapter 40, right? That he's going to be measuring now, in this case, this measuring, I mean, it applies to building a city, but here it's also a judgment, right? So this is talking about God's people being judged. Um, and so everything here in Zechariah is a message to the people about what God is, is planning to do in building a new temple in having this golden lampstand, all of these things, it's really tying us in with Ezekiel. Right. But is this also not more for the movement than it is for anything else? Well, I mean, all of the things are written for the end of the world. So we definitely can apply it to this movement. So this movement is in this same situation um, that... That Israel was at the time of 
the rebuilding of the temple, right? Because aren't we in a period of the rebuilding of the temple? Yes. And we so the messages, the messages of Haggai and Zechariah must apply to us. As, as we've been looking at this, the messages of Haggai, Zechariah, Zephaniah, all of these have to be being applied to the movement right now. Okay. Well, yes, but, but it does apply to our bigger line as well, because uh, who's the king in, at the time of Zechariah? It's Darius. Right? No disagreement. And who does Darius represent in our lines? I'm not tracking well today. Okay, so when we deal with the story of of um, we dealt with uh, uh, what's the, the kings, right? You got you know can be can be seas and so forth. Three shall stand up yet in Persia. Hello. Hello. The, yeah, I'm I'm getting all sorts of of little blocks all over my screen. I don't understand why. <laughs> because I'm searching something. Ah. And and I'm sharing that screen. So um, so you're just gonna see those things. I don't know why it does that. I have to take care of something very quickly. I'll be right back. Okay. So with what uh, Dwight is referring to here, we have, who does Darius represent in, in, the, in the presidents of the United States? Anybody? We don't remember Daniel chapter 11. <clears throat> so we have um, when we're talking about Darius the Persian, right? So we know Darius the Mede represents uh, Reagan, and Cyrus is going to represent George Bush Sr. And then we have three stand up Cambyses, uh, False Smyrtus, and Darius. And then the fourth that is far richer than them all, that's going to be Xerxes, which would be Trump, correct? Is anybody there? Yes. Okay. So, so Darius represents Obama, right? Yeah, if you go down the line like that, yeah. Yeah, okay. So that's how we understand these lines. We understand uh, so So we got Obama lining up with Darius. So if we're going to put the building of the temple in the time of Darius, how would we then place Zechariah? What period in this movement's history? Because it's going to be under 
um, Bush two false smirtus that you're going to have 9-11, right? I mean, if we're just taking this as... <clears throat> So when does when does Obama come into power? <clears throat> two thousand eight. So two thousand eight. So in this movement, if we're going to say that that it's in the period that Obama is in power, that the the building of the temple goes forth or gets completed, uh, Obama Obama is in power from two thousand eight to two thousand sixteen. Right. Roughly 2017, if you go when Trump actually gets inaugurated. And in this time in this movement, if, we, if we're going to take that it happens in the time of Obama, isn't that really where we established that it was occurring in this movement? Pretty much. Okay. So if we're going to take Zechariah then, um, we have to apply him to this movement and we can apply it to a period of time during Obama. So there is a message that goes forth to this movement in that time, which is these different types of measures, right? These different things that Zechariah is talking about. Isn't that what happens in the movement, right? So again, if you go, there's a call to return to the Lord, right? There's the vision of the horseman. There's the vision of the man with the measuring line. There's the vision of Joshua, the high priest. So this is righteousness by faith. The golden lampstand. So this is, what's the golden lampstand represent as far as we relate it to prophecy? <clears throat> because in that vision of the golden lampstand, it says, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands all shall, shall finish it. So, would this be a reference to the message of Jeff? Or is it to something else? Why wouldn't it be a, a reference to Jeff's message? Well, it would have to be. If we're going to take it in that this is in the time of Darius, and, and Jeff had been there at the beginning, right. Right at the time of the end, 1989. So he's going to have to be there in this period of time, all the way up to... Uh, the completion of this temple, right? And though this temple is completed in the time of Darius, it's, so this temple is referring to something specific, right? So the vision of the flying scroll, um, this has this measurement of the 2520, right? Correct. That's how we've understood it. And now we have the woman, the vision of the woman in the baths basket. So this must be a message to this movement regarding a judgment that comes upon this movement. Um, now, is it is it a judgment that comes upon the movement, or is this woman in the basket with the lead being a judgment upon the corporate church? No. This is about within the movement. Okay. These are because the movement has in it the elements of Babylon. Okay. Right. Now, maybe you could say it's the corporate church in the sense that many of the people in the movement have been attached to the corporate church and are still attached to it. Right. Right. But this, um, this woman is going to be born away to Babylon. Right. So it's going to be established, it'll be established and set there upon her own base. So the question is, are we going to be a part of God's temple and his judgment, right? Or are we going to be a part of Babylon and its judgment? If that makes sense. Because those who enter into the judgment of the temple are going to be saved. But see, this woman is not entering into the judgment of the temple. Right, exactly. That's why I'm looking at this as a separation between those that are willing to be judged according to the temple, according to the true righteousness by faith, because 
if we if we're looking at the steps into the entire sanctuary we have justification sanctification judgment and glorification mm -hmm. but this woman that is sitting upon the ephah mm -hmm. in the basket mm -hmm. is not part of that because it's being born to babylon right Right. Yeah. So that's the judgment that that comes upon those who are not going to be um, judged, but with the righteous, they're going to be judged with the wicked. But they're judged by prophecy. Right. It's going to be a, a judgment of prophecy, but with a correct understanding of chronology. Yeah. And, and just another little note, um, in Zechariah chapter 1, verse 7, uh, we have the 24th day of the 11th month. Uh, what, is, what is that a reference to that we've recently looked at? November 24th. That's November 24th, isn't it? As a symbol. Okay. Okay. Now, um, is that another uh, another point like we, we've talked about briefly about the Thanksgiving prediction? Yeah. Yeah. So, and now this this vision happens in I think it's five. I think it's five eighteen BC. I can't remember when this happens. It's in the. Uh, it says here in uh, the second year of Darius. So I, I'm trying to remember. I'm pretty sure it's five eighteen. Um. So if you go into the second year of Darius and you look at this date. Um. Let me see, I have to find this here. Um, no, so that's going to be 520. I'm good. Yeah, it's 522 is his first year. Okay, so we have to go. Okay. So it's, it actually ends up being in um, February 15th, 519 BC, that this vision occurs, if I'm doing this correctly. Yeah. It's the 24th of Sabatu in the, in the second year of Darius. And so it's February 15th on the Julian calendar. So I don't know the significance of that, but um, we can definitely look at the date of the 24th day of the 11th month as being a symbol of this date that's coming up that we don't know what it means yet, if it means anything other than a symbol but it might refer to something internal within the movement. <clears throat> it has to be something within the movement. Yeah. And um, uh, there's in in um, chapter seven, there's going to be another vision in the fourth day of the ninth month that they have this vision. Now, the fourth day of the ninth month is an inversion of the ninth day of the fourth month. That is, uh, Jerusalem was, uh, the walls of Jerusalem were bre breached on 
the ninth day of the fourth month. And this is an inversion of it, but it's also a symbol of 49. And it's gonna be, um, so the ninth month here is named Kislev. Um, here they say Chislu, but it's Kislev. Um, and Miller's birthday was February 15th. I, I remembered there was something about February 15th, but I just couldn't think what it was. And um, so. But it's so also that, Pius the sixth being taken in 1798, as right. Andrew pointed out. Right. Yeah. So in 1798, it's also this date. And we had, we had worked out this structure um, with these dates. And I, I have these in charts and everything. So when we were counting the numbering of the tribes, right, the numbers of the tribes. So um, I can just quickly show you, I think this is it. Yeah, we had a chart dealing with these periods of time, the connection with September 11th. No, I don't know. It's, this would be too complicated to look at right now. There's too much happening here. Um, so we have this time of the end symbol, February 15th, 1798, when the Pope's taken captive. And it's also uh, Miller's birthday. Um, and I just don't see the chart I have with Miller's birthday. I thought I had it on the chart, but. Hmm. Oh yeah, here it is. So here's the chart. <clears throat> So what you see here, when you see it, <clears throat> is uh, you're going to have December 25th, 1717. So we already looked at 1717, didn't we? We were talking about that earlier because of, of the doubling in the one verse, yes. And that verse is in which, it, was it uh, First Chronicles 1717 or 1 Samuel? 1 Samuel. Yeah, okay, so 1 Samuel 17, 17. And, and so December 25th, 1717 um, is Pope Pius VI's birthday. Right. And so he's born on a Christmas day, which is a, an important symbol in our lines. And then he uh, becomes cardinal on April 26th, 1773. And then 660 days later, on February 15th, 1775, um, he becomes Pope Pius VI. And he's going to be consecrated seven days later on February 22, which ties us with Samuel Snow's letters. And, and, and here we have the dark day, because that was part of this, this structure, this understanding of these lines. Um, so that's going to be that May 19, 1780. And then you have the birth of Miller on February 15th, 1782. So we have a symbol there of July 18, 2020, along with this February 15th date. Okay. And then Pope Pius is taken captive in February 15th, 1798, 16 years later after Miller's born. So Miller's 16th birthday, Pope Pius is taken captive. And, and then there's 18,720 days from the time that Miller is born until May 19th, uh, 1833, when we have um, uh, the, the falling of the stars, right? Okay. Um, Now that's going to be, uh, I'm just trying to think here. So it's not on May 19th that we have the falling of the stars, uh, but it's a symbolic date of May 19th that brings us back to the dark day, right? So the falling of stars is on a different date than that. 
but it's in 1833, the year of the falling of the stars and the year that Miller um, receives his credentials. So, so anyway, there's a bunch of other things in there, all these different symbolic dates. But the point is we have this February 15th date. And that's connected with, as we pointed out, the November 24th date. <clears throat> All right. Is that, that making sense to people? So February 15th represents the time of the end um, as a symbol. And November 24th, uh, ties us to that symbol because that date in Zechariah chapter uh, chapter one. I know this gets um, gets kind of right on, where's, where's November twenty fourth on the chart there? I don't see it. It's not on that chart. So we haven't put when I made this chart. I hadn't put November twenty fourth yet. No. Oh, okay. Right. So November 24th is is I haven't even looked at the connection between November 24th and Millerite history yet. We have looked at it in connection with. Um, and so when you look at November 24th, it's going to be here. This is the November 24th, and it's going to tie us to this April 26 date, 1990, with 11,900 11, days. And 11 times 24 is a symbol of 264, which is April 26th. Um, but it does tie us to July 18th being 859 days, which in base eight is 1533. And um, it also ties us to June 9th when we began time setting 1629 days. And then from uh, November 9th, uh, 2019, it's 1111 days. So symbol of Daniel 1111. And other 1111. It's the 11 years and the 11 years in the story of Joseph, the 11 generations, the 11 generations to be 22 generations from Adam to the going down into Egypt. So there's all different kinds of symbols that are tied together. The point is we can take the story of Zechariah and we can look at the date that Zechariah begins prophesying. And um, well, it's, he actually starts in the eighth month in the second year of Darius. And this one doesn't give us a specific day. So he's going to have his first vision in the eighth month. Uh, but then in the 420th day of the 11th month in the second year of Darius, and it's still going to be in the second year of Darius. So this is going to be, we just don't know what date Zechariah 1.1 1, 1 is. Um, but we do know this is the first one we're given the date, the actual day of the month. And that one's going to tie to the symbol of February 15th, which is the time of the end. So we could probably take Zechariah and put it upon a line and see that Zechariah also represents uh, a prophetic line. Okay, so is that sufficient there, Dwight, to deal with what we saw with the EFA? Well, there, there's quite a bit in this that is just when you're looking at the symbols between the EFA, the bath, and the Homer. Yeah, so the Homer is uh, 10 times that of an EFA. But at different times, it's given different uh, relationships. Okay, right. And that's, that, that was one of the confusing things for me, because when you look at this with Omer or Homer. Yeah. However it's being presented. Yeah, an Omer. It's also being used as a way to define mortar or heaps. Well, yeah, because of, of having to do with uh, the meaning of the word itself. So, because an omer is a heap. Okay. Right. 
but you know that's originally where it comes from and then it's related to mortar because mortars are are heaps so tread the mortar but anyway um yeah so it just has to do with the way that the word developed and how it's its implications um but but an omer is um uh here an ether is one bath and, and an ephah and a bath are the same thing. So one homer is one tenth of an ephah. Is that right. what they're saying? Okay. That's what the verse is saying. Yeah. And that's in Ezekiel. So he's going to give this measurement for what uh, a homer is or an omer. It's also in Exodus. Yeah. But there, yeah. And it just tells you in Exodus um, uh, 1636. Um, An omer is the tenth part of an ephah. So again, it's just a tenth part. So, you know, not sure what you wrote there. One over omer equals a, ho a homer. If it should be a tenth part of an ephah. But anyway. We are told, just like in, in the building of Oh, I see what you're saying. It's just that it's the same word. It's okay. the same word, right. Yeah, that's just different pronunciation. Okay. <clears throat> but in, in these situations, when the... Um, altar was to be built, mm -hmm. they were not to use mortar, they were not to use slime. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's just the stones are just cut and put together. They're not mortared together. Correct. To, to attach them. But this omer, the word itself, is also used for mortar. The omer was also the measure that was to be allotted to the Israelites. It was the measure of the manna. That's one tenth of the ephah. And as, as we have been addressing, I mean, tenth being a representation of judgment, right? Yeah. Well, it's tenth is also a representation. So it's a test. Ten can represent a test. Correct. One tenth represents a remnant. Okay. So when you have a tenth of something, it's different than ten of something. Though 10 of something can be a test, 10 of something can also represent a remnant as well, depending on the context. But a 10th isn't, doesn't necessarily mean judgment. It's, it's, it's usually a reference to the remnant. So dealing with these with the heaps, mm -hmm. Of course, we had Exodus 8.14 when they had to gather the frogs. Yeah. And in that one, the, the word omer was repeated. So you have omer, omer. Yeah, that just means lot, big, huge heaps. That's the Hebrew a way of saying big heaps. Okay. Right? Just double the word. But symbolically in a situation like that, a doubling like that would point to the second angel's message, wouldn't it? Yeah, or, or to midnight and the midnight cry, yes. Okay. Right. And we know that this is, is preceding the midnight cry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The point in looking through the rest of these verses, we have been asking ourselves the questions, what what yet has to be done prior to the midnight cry? And so the question that I've been asking myself as I've studied through this, is this showing us prophetically the steps that we yet have to take before we're going to be prepared to give that midnight cry? I mean, we've come to July 18th. We're coming close to the symbol of midnight. 
Right. But well, the symbol of midnight on the line of the Levites. So right. message to the church. So that, that is our repeated line of Millerite history. Right. Not, not the big line. No, not the big line at all. No. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Because we've got to be able to focus on the steps that are being taken in our line in order to be able to understand the steps that will then be taken on the big line. Mm -hmm. So the more I looked at this with everything else that was going on, the more I was, I was questioning whether this with the EFA symbolically is telling us something further that we need to pay attention to in our line right now, because the steps that are being taken with those that have continued to study is the preparatory work of the 144,000. The 144,000 will be those that call the Levites, but the message has been going out to begin to wake up the Levites. Once the Levites are called and then prepared, then the message goes out to the rest of the world so that they may come to an understanding of the message. Would that not be the way we would understand this? Yes. So... Um... So when we deal with this, um, okay, so there's a number of things. I, I know I'm, I'm listening to you half ways, but I'm also noticing something else that, that relates to this. So, okay. um, so I'm going to go here to the Bible where we were looking. So we're looking at Exodus 1636. <coughs> now, Omer is the 10th part of an ephah. Um, so, um, but when I was looking at this, I was looking back at this section, right? Because remember, this is dealing with the manna. Right. Okay. And remember, um, Adilio had addressed 1629. Now, when he had looked at 1629, remember he had used number 1629. And number 1629 had to do with um, if these men die, the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. And he's using this to show that 1629 represents some kind of close of probation for this movement if we don't accept the Trump prediction, right? Agreed. Okay. Now, he didn't really um, look at everything about the 1629. So, right. so he didn't really look at the whole con uh, context of what this was about. Um, this was about Korah's rebellion. Right? Korah, so, Dathan, and Abiram, right? Yeah, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, yeah. So number 1690, 1629 is in that context. It's in a context of a rebellion that's occurring. Now, we also, so he also looked at Leviticus 1629, I believe, or was it Exodus 1629? I can't remember. Um, but anyway, in 1629, it says, this shall be a statute forever unto you, that in the seventh month, on the 10th day of the month, ye shall afflict your souls, and do no work at all, whether it be of your own country or stranger that sojourneth among you. So this is, of course, the close of probation, the 10th day of the seventh month. But we also have the Exodus 1629. I can't remember which two he looked at. He only looked at two of them. And, and I looked at the third one as well. So I think he might have taken the Leviticus one and the numbers one. But I don't think he looked at the Exodus one. 
but we've made this application of this um, this manna to this period of time uh, that connects all of these different structures together. Right. Right. So, so that's how we've looked at it. And uh, when we take the manna, uh, so I'm just going to go here uh, back to this chart. Right. This is going to go from this April 26th, um, 1990 date, all the way to April 5th, 2030. That's going to be the period that the manna falls. But we know the manna is based upon this week right? It's going to establish the week. So 168 days, there's 168 hours in a week. So this 168 represents the week. We also have this 1629 days that goes to November 24th, 2020, from the time that this movement begins time setting. So that means we have um, some information regarding 1629 that Odilio didn't have and also information about the manna that he didn't have. So when we look at what he was presenting and what Colin was presenting, and we look at all the other information, we would have to say that this is definitely pointing to what's happening in the movement presently. And, and we're applying it here in judges to these uh, specifically, this is going to be this offering that's made, right? And, and we're saying that this is um, referring to a test that we're going to have verses 20 and 21 referring to, or 21 and 22, pardon me, referring to uh, the publication of the paper in the Tennessean and its worldwide proclamation of the July 18, 2020 message, correct? Right. So, and, and that's going to be in connection with this offering. And that's where this EFA is connected. And so we can connect this message to this November 24, 2022 date as something to do with internal within the movement. So once Colin's prediction ends, Somehow, whether it's symbolic date or whatever, but we know that when his prediction ends, we have these symbols that we can tie together, right? Okay. I mean, there, there's a lot of symbols there. There's a lot of threads that, that, we are, that we're looking at that we have to pull together uh, to get the whole picture. But I think this would help confirm what we've been talking about because this this offering is this putting together of this message right and it's a test right the message of july 18 but then after that uh we have well the building of this altar so they tear down this altar right they build this new altar and they offer it upon it this uh Bullock, right? Seven years old. So we're saying that this is the work that was being done after July 18th. And the 10 men of his servants represent the remnant that is those of the movement who continue to study, right? Okay. And they have to do this by night. That is, it's not prominent within the movement. And the word night is 391.5. And if we, if we go back to uh, um, the 391 words, uh, that message from Jeff's, which we would refer to before we were recording, which is in five paragraphs, um, we would then have to see that this, this is referring to the work that is specifically being done right now that is being misrepresented. And there's going to be those who are still worshiping at the altar of Baal, right? So they're gonna 
cut down the altar of Baal and um, all these different things happen where the children of the East gather together. And now you're going to have this war that's going on, which would represent what's happening in the movement presently. And the spirit of the Lord in verse 34 came upon Gideon. He blew a trumpet and Abi Ezer was gathered after him. And they send messengers throughout all Manasseh, who also was gathered after him and sent messengers unto Asher, to Zebulun, and to Naphtali. Now we have these names mentioned here, but we've also have part of this message has to do with the, the symbols of um, the numbering of the tribes of these tribes, right? Zebulun, Naphtali, and Asher, we've used the numbering of these tribes to represent periods of time and dates connected to this movement, right? Connecting us to Millerite history. So now we're gonna have the sign of the fleece, which we were addressing before, and the sign of the fleece, we understood as two different, um, two different tests that are a mirror, mirror of each other. So I don't know if we specifically agreed upon what these would mean. mean. We just sort of have this in a general sense. We haven't really placed these, except to say that there's something, um, that these, these fleeces being set out have not yet um, served their purpose. So I don't know what they mean, other than that it has to do with the Holy Spirit. Right, which is what the do represents. Any thoughts on that? I've got to consider the fleece a little more carefully. Yeah, and I know we, we haven't we haven't really decided on it, what it means. Hmm. Now, this, this is a test that uh, Gideon, who represents the message of July 18th, sets out. Now, but he's giving, I mean, as it says in 638, yeah. it was so, for he rose up early on the morrow. So, they're studying at night, not as part of a, an open study. It's, it's one that they're having to privately study. And now he rises up in the mo on the morrow in the light. Yeah. And he puts out the fleece in the light. Mm-hmm. What can we make from them? Okay, so, well, he puts out the fleece the night before and he goes in the morrow and then takes the fleece and wrings it out in the morning. Okay. Right? All right. Because he puts it out at nighttime and then in the morning he sees the result. And then he's, he's going to do the same thing the next night. So there's these two days in which he does it, two nights in which he tests God to see whether God is leading him or not. But, but the question is, what specific, specifically are these tests? How can we place them on a line? Now, so I've had a number of different ideas. Um, I mean, one is we can take the, that the movement of July 18 has these two different tests. Uh, one has to do with the pandemic and one has to do with Trump. So that's, that could be Odilio and Collins test. Um, and, and that may be, that may be correct. We also though have, 
um, symbols here that that we have seen in regarding how because we've taken all of this and we've seen this November 24th date. We've seen all of these di different dates. A uh, bowl full of water, a laver. Well, it is a basin, which comes from the word to depress. I, I looked at the word. I don't know. Angela's just commenting about that. Um, however, we understand this. We know that this is the Holy Spirit. That, it, that this test is going to demonstrate. So wouldn't it be better to take this as something to do with our parallel studies? Because what are our two parallel studies that we're having here? Examining the lines and righteousness by faith. Right. Okay. So, so we have the examination of the lines. And, and God keeps putting dates out in front of us. And right now we have two. We have November 24th coming up in... 23 days. And then we also have um, um, the April 5th, 2030 date, which is much further in the future. What about November 6th? The November 8th? Party. Well, that's, yeah, but that's not, that's the date Colin put. It's still part of the structure. And we can also say, of course, we have January 11th, 2023, right? Um, so we have these different dates that are part of these structures. Um, and even um, if we go into, let me see here. Um, Gotta find this here. Okay, so January eleventh, twenty twenty three. Um, oh, where's this structure? I'm trying to find. Hmm. Okay. So here, here is the chart. <clears throat> so this is basically Colin study. Okay, that's not on the screen. There you go. Yeah, it just takes a bit for it to transfer. So we got the midterm election on November 8th, right? And we have these 65 days to January 11th, 2023. Now, the way that these are uh, set up is this is the prophetic mirror going back to November 3rd, 2020, uh, when we had the election of, of Joe Biden, right? And then we have 65 days to the siege of Washington, D.C. on January 6th. Now, these are inclusive counts, right? So 60, it's the 65th day we did it as an ordinal count. And we divided this up. We see uh, November 22nd from November 3rd, uh, 2020. And we see that we have the 19 days. And then that 45, 46 is the, um, <clears throat> uh, whether we did it as a cardinal count or an ordinal count. And then we have all these symbols of July 18, uh, 1700 or 718 days, so that's July 18th, and 781 days. Again, that's the 18th of July, if you read it backwards. And the number of days from the center of here, 780 days, which is 18,720 hours, 111 weeks. Uh, and then the number of seconds here, uh, this would be the number of seconds that you would have. This symbolizes uh, the helicine the number of parts of a day, 25,920. Anyway, there's all of these different symbols. Again, you see here from January 11th to February 16th, 2030, uh, and the 49 days, this is taking the 26, 
26,040 days, which is 88 months. And we tied this into the story of um, Ezra, et cetera. So there's lots of different symbols here. Um, now, when we get go from November 8th to November 24th, um, how many days is that? Sixteen days, I'm saying. Okay. So it's sixteen days. Okay. Um, so uh, just hang on. What was I doing here? But it's not working. Okay. So we have 16 days. Now, what does 16 represent? Yeah, February 16th, which is okay. snow. Right. So you could you could tie it in with that. Um Now, of course, we could count it as 17 days inclusive, right? So there are different ways we could look at it. Another way we can look at it is we have um, the date is November 24th. Now notice that Collins has 1224. Uh, he tried to make this 1225. Um, now he would do that by, I, I'm not sure how he did it because it didn't really make sense. Um, otherwise he would have to, I guess he would have to take this 46 inclusively, uh, but that wouldn't work. How would you get um, 46 to go from November 8th to December 25th. I guess you could do it exclusively or something. I don't, I can't remember how he was getting December 25th. Maybe he was doing some other way completely differently. But so if we have 1124 and 1224, anyway, we're going to just deal with 1224. What does that symbolize? Because we know 1124 is 11 times 24 is 264. They're both a doubling. Okay, they're doubling, right? Now, um, we could also take. Um, 1224 could be um, 12 plus 24. I mean, we don't necessarily need to multiply them. We could do some other mathematical calculation. And if we get 36, what does 36 represent? I mean, the question that I'm asking, maybe I'm, I'm sort of going in. Three and a half years. It, three and a half years. Yeah, so it can represent um, three and a half years. It can represent, of course, 360, the year day principle. But the question is, if we take Collins line, um, I mean, this is a prophetic mirror that comes to January 11th, 2023. I mean, Maybe we can take this as both ways, that there are two different groups that are making tests. I don't know if that makes sense or not. Now we have the test as being chronology and righteousness by faith. These are the things that we're using to see God's leading. But Odilio had his study, Colin had his study. They both used chronology. And, and, and we would say the chronology is correct.
<clears throat> so what is this message telling us about this prophetic mirror? Who's, who's, uh, what does the prophetic mirror represent? I mean, it's the 2520, but here it's more connected with the July 18, 2020 prediction. Any thoughts on that, how, how we would understand this? I was looking at your 11.24 versus 12.24 for a second. So, okay. I mean, as, as you pointed out, the 11.24 multiplied gives us 2.64 which 26th day of the fourth month. 1224 multiplied gives us 288, which is a doubling of 144. Okay. Yeah. So one has an interrelation with the Levites. One has an interrelation with the 144,000. Okay. Okay. I mean, it, wouldn't that be symbolically what we've addressed in the past? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's, that's why I'm, I, I was having issues with this where Colin was pushing it to 1225 because the 1224 fits so much better. Yeah. And, and I didn't really understand how he could get that but you know it just could be me not really understanding what he was doing and maybe i missed something but um he was also trying to relate this uh december 25th to other dis december 25th but there i didn't see december 25th i saw december 24th right so it just could be me not understanding i don't know So, <clears throat> but there's a lot for us to consider here, especially with what's going to be coming up in this next week. Yes. So, so, I mean, and I think, you know, we're at this point here where what we're studying is connected to what's happening. Right. So so we're kind of in the midst of things trying to sort out all of these symbols. But, you know, we have the symbol of the manna. Right. And the manna is this extremely important symbol because it represents a message from God. It represents Christ. Right. The eating of his the flesh, the drinking of his blood, the water, of course, that follows them in the wilderness as well. Right. So. Um, so this movement has to be doing this. And, and the question is, you know, are we doing this properly? Are we doing this correctly? I mean, I mean, I know that other people are studying as well. Now, my perspective is that their studies are fairly basic. And they're definitely not going as deeply into chronology as we are. And, and also some of the studies that are a bit deeper, like Colin studies, they seem to be unwilling to look at things that disagree with their position, which, of course, we have to. And there can't also be de dependence upon men. There has to be a, depends a dependence upon God to correct us when we're in error. Because if we just depend upon man, we're going to persist down the same course. We're going to make the same mistakes we've made in the past. So what we haven't decided here about the fleece, and I know our time is up, and we're going to have to look at this tomorrow, is we have to figure out what the ground represents and what the fleece itself represents. And then what the water that comes out represents. Right. Well, the water, well, well we know the water is the Holy Spirit. 
I mean, that's pretty clear from when we do, uh, when we check the do. Um, at least be a message, at least be a message. Well, I don't know, right? And, and we have the ground and the fleece, right? Yeah. And it's this reverse thing. So to try to figure out what this specifically means, I think, um, because we're saying that we can put all these things on a line and we can date them. That is, we can place a date for what these tests are. So anyway, um, we're gonna have to close with prayer. So join me in prayer if you can. Dear Father in heaven, uh, thank you so much for this study. And uh, we ask for your continued uh, presence as we contemplate these things throughout this day and come together tomorrow to further examine these details. We are thankful for the light that you've given us. Help us to walk in that light. I pray for those who are suffering different ailments, such as Dwight with his vertigo and other health problems that, um, that we can have, also our spiritual need and other physical needs. And Toby and his family. And yes, we pray also for Toby and his family in their morning time and the opportunity that uh, this brings in connecting with others. We pray that your angels can watch over them and that your Holy Spirit can speak to each heart. Um, forgive us our sins and help us to cling to you each day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.